Hi, I'm Marty. And I'm Beth. We are coming to you live from the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Today we want to begin by welcoming Providence Middle School. Randy Bresnick and Paula Nespoli spent six months on the International Space Station. While there, they did a lot of work and a lot of science. Paula conducted more than 60 experiments while in space. Randy did three spacewalks and even took a fidget spinner with him. We'll be talking to both of them today. This, this is 7.30. We're joined by Randy Comrade Bresnik and Paolo Nespoli. Thank you guys for joining us on STEM and 30 today. Very happy to be here. Now, uh, if you're watching online on Facebook, go down to the comments section and submit your questions. Anything that you've ever wanted to know about an astronaut is fair game. Like if these guys like circus peanuts or not, put it down in the comments section. And if, you're not, if you don't have a question, tell us where you're watching from. But before we get to those questions, we've got a few friends from Providence Elementary School who are gonna ask the first questions. Go ahead. What was the most stressful, being on Earth and space or coming back? We had the unfortunate occurrence of, while we were in space, having a hurricane go through Houston. And so even though I went through some physical stress of being in a rocket launching to space and leaving my family behind, or coming back through the atmosphere and going from 17,500 miles an hour to zero, to me the most stressful was watching Hurricane Harvey go over Houston while my wife and two kids were underneath it. Yep, uh, I would agree on that. I mean, we do a lot of things in space that are kind of, I wouldn't say stressful, but you know, you really need to have to be involved with it. Uh, but, uh, but thinking of what the people are doing, because we have, we have control, we think we have control of what happens up, up there, but, but you really don't know what is going on down there. So I would agree with, uh, with Randy. What was the hardest thing to get used to when you came back from space? Hardest thing to get used to was when you get up to space, right now we have an otolith organ in our ears, right? And that gives us our balance because there's little hairs that are moved by the fluid that go through the canals in our ears that gives us our balance. Well, when you get to space, that all stops because there's no gravity to move the, the fluid in your ear. And so we move around by what we see and, and what we can touch. And so when you come back to Earth, now all of a sudden that fluid gets moved by gravity and starts moving again, starts actuating those hairs and giving us those sensations. And so when we had to uh, move, Paolo, I sat on the left side of the Soyuz, Paolo sat on the right, and we had to move to the center seat to be able to go out the hatch when we got back on the ground. And when we lifted ourselves up out of that seat and had to go this way, wow, it felt like we were tumbling. Even though we were just kind of leaning over, it felt like we were tumbling. And so getting that inner ear back up to speed took several days. And so that was probably, for me, the most, most difficult part. Well, well, I would say quickly that, uh, you know, I got to space and I kind of, thought I was Spider-Man and Superman, you know, I was flying out the ceiling, going this, picking up stuff, uh, and then suddenly I'm back on Earth, and gravity uh, gets hold of me, and that was really, really hard. I mean, I felt like I was chained to the, to the seat, I could barely walk, and that's what was the most uh, strong for me, not anymore being able to fly up to the ceiling and do things. It's like they slipped kryptonite in Paolo's pocket or something. Yeah, that's what they did. Well, great questions, guys. Now, you all spent 139 days in space. Can you tell us a little bit about that mission? Sure. We uh, ended up flying up there. And you know, International Space Station has now been up there 20 years. So one third of NASA's lifetime, we've had the International Space Station. And the fact that human beings have been manning the space station continuously for 18 years is absolutely amazing. And we've had crews vary from everywhere, from crew of three to two, and now we're actually having a crew of six up there, and that is our standard crew size. And so we went up there and joined the crew of Expedition 52. They had been up there for several months, and we joined them, our crew of three, Paolo, myself, and Sergei Rozanski from Russia. And we uh, were up there. We had Expedition 52 for about 
five weeks. They left, and then another crew came up on a different Soyuz, and that's the crew you see up on the screen there, Expedition 53. And we were joined by Sasha Masurkin, a Russian fighter pilot, Mark Vandehei, an Army officer, and Joe Akaba, who actually had been a former Marine. He had been a Peace Corps person, but he had actually been a teacher. When he was selected to be an astronaut, he was teaching science and math uh, in schools and became an astronaut. So they joined us for Expedition uh, 53. And so we ride up and down uh, to the, uh, the space station in the Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, it is a very small spacecraft. It's designed to get us up and back, and that's it. And it's only this big. So imagine Powell and I and somebody else in spacesuits in a space only this big. And we're in these tiny little seats, and, but it takes us safely to the atmosphere. We go from zero uh, miles per hour to 17,500 miles an hour in six hours or four orbits around the Earth, we actually dock to the space station. And that Soyuz sits there and waits for us for the entire length of our mission, and that's what we come home in as well. We do, when, uh, when of course we go to space, uh, this is a house laboratory where you live and work, and that's the reason why we go to space, because in this environment, we can do incredible things that you cannot do here on Earth. So we do science, technology. You wake up in the morning and you start working on experiments that have to do with uh, crazy stuff, uh, genetics, uh, uh, spinning motors, uh, fluid. You work on the ceiling, you work on the wall, you work everywhere, you turn around. And it's, it's actually very, very interesting. Uh, uh, most of the time we don't understand what, what, what we are doing. We know how to run the experiments. We know how to do things. Randy, what were you doing here, for example? Well, we have a glove box where we're able to do science inside of it. And this particular experiment, we're actually growing lung tissue. And lung tissue can grow perfectly in space because there's not gravity weighing on it and crushing the cells as they try and grow. And this particular experiment, they're looking at cures for cancer. And so our, our crewmate Jack Fisher dubbed this the cancer-seeking missiles. So right now we have cancer treatments that you know, go and try and kill the cancer cells, but also affects the, a lot of the rest of the body. If we can actually go out and send out medicines and, and treatments that actually target only the cancer cells, the bad cells, that is going to be a huge, huge improvement for people that end up having cancer down here because we can actually kill the cancer but not harm their body. So that's something that has real application uh, up there for what we're uh, looking to do uh, down here on Earth. And this was just one of the 300 plus uh, experiments that we did in space. Of course, you need to make sure that you are able to do things. You know, you have to handle stuff, make sure that things don't float away. Uh, you need to be careful of what you're doing. Uh, you do experiments in the Japanese laboratory, in the European laboratory, in the American laboratory. Sometimes you go to the Russian part of the station. So it's very, very uh, incredible, quick, stuff that you're doing. You play with refrigerators. Of course, those are very cool refrigerators. You better have gloves. Minus 80. Otherwise, the, your, your hands are going to be stuck to the, to the pieces of metal that you take out from there. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, we are the guinea pigs in space. You know, you are the subject of the uh, investigations. You know, we take blood, we measure things. And we play doctor, or we play, you know, guinea pig, and, and, and this is in a rapid succession. Uh, we, we have, uh, we do some crazy experiments. Uh, this one had to do with fluids in space, the way the heat and fluids, I mean, complex, very complex things. And we set up these experiments so the scientists can actually look at this little, mini, tiny, minute details that you cannot really see here on Earth, and that's why we go up there. And sometimes it's the experiments where we're actually making things happen, and other times where uh, we'll actually set up the experiment and they'll run it remotely from the ground. And so you could be involved in the space program, be running an experiment from your computer or down from a laboratory down here, and then have it actually be happening up on the space station. And so that's the wide variety of things that we do. Paolo's working on this one, which is a combustion chamber. We're actually burning flames up there, and we have one called Cool Flames, where it actually takes uh, flames, and we're able to find out we're able to burn things at like 800 degrees instead of at 1200, which is where flames normally burn. Well, if we can do that, guess what? We can make airplanes maybe a little safer, a little lighter. We can actually maybe burn our fuel a little more efficiently. So as a pilot, that's really exciting stuff for me, and you know, also help make our spacecraft uh, safer. And uh, so on the, on, what I was saying before that you can be a guinea pig, and here is a very complex 
complex uh, experiment that we were running on the European Space Agency laboratory there. It's, a, it's an experiment where you actually take your leg and hook it up to a machine and then the machine makes your leg move or you try to move the machine. It's a very long, uh, stressful experiment. We use electrical shock to shock your uh, muscles so the muscle can contract and the machine can actually measure the force that you are doing in space. All of this because? The human being, the bodies are affected by zero gravity quite a bit. And so our muscles, like especially our legs, we don't use them for anything when we're up there normally. We're moving around, like Apollo said, with our hands. And so if the muscles aren't working, then they're starting to atrophy. Like if you stayed in bed for like a month or two months, you'd be a lot weaker. Well, then if that happens, then your bones start losing density as well. And so we need to measure how the human body can go ahead and uh, lose its capability. But then how can we make countermeasures so that we don't? So when we get to Mars, we're able to work. This particular experiment Paul mentioned about the, the uh, um, the zapping it with electricity. Well, we can tell ourselves or in our minds to move our muscles. But guess what? Your muscles have a lot more capability than what your mind can tell it to do. So we actually have us working as hard as we think we can, then they zap it to actually see how much more capability your muscle has more than what you're thinking. And so we do that testing on the ground and in space to see if there's a difference. It was so, a fun experiment, right? It was fun uh, when it was over. <laughs> That's why we had that picture where we got shaking our hands. It's done. Yeah. Uh, no more sh uh, shocking for today. And so you know, when you look up at, the, at the, what you're seeing right now, that is Paul and I working. And you can see a tablet. So the same technology that you guys probably have at home or at school, using a tablet of some sort to be able to do your homework or look online to, to, to find some research, we use on the space station to go through our procedures. Um, we actually, actually uh, do more stuff for exploration going long distances. We're actually, here's Joe Acaba looking uh, at our special experiment called veggie. And guess what we grew up there? We grew three types of lettuce. And you go to a grocery store and you go into the produce section and guess what? The lettuce, you don't typically smell the lettuce. You smell the lemons and the oranges because those are really strong. But when you're in a space capsule for months at a time and all you smell is each other, Guess what? Lettuce has a really good smell. Actually, you know, actually we, we got we got the authority. The, uh, Houston told us we could take a, a little a little leaf and, and test it. And I thought, you know, it's a piece of grass. You know, it's lettuce. It doesn't taste like nothing. And instead, it was an amazing taste. You know, when you don't taste la lettuce, when when you when your senses are kind of dumbed down because of the closed environment, you taste something like this, and you really understand what humans can do and what, what, what really means being human and have all these senses, it's, it's incredible. All right, we also do a lot of other things when we're on the space station. Um, we get to go and look at the Earth and that's one of our favorite things to do is to take pictures uh, of the Earth and try and share the incredible beauty with you guys. And we've done that you know, via our social media, via the NASA web pages and all this stuff's out there for you guys to go look at. You can, all you have to do is Google um, the NASA space pictures or Expedition 53 and you can see all these types of things. We also had you know, spacewalks. We had to do, do repairs on the inside. We also had to do repairs on the outside. And so we get into our spacesuits um, two at a time and we actually then button them up, do leak checks and head outside. And you got 300 pounds of equipment but you're in your own personal spacecraft with your own atmosphere. And we work for about six to seven hours. And then we have really talented people on the inside like Paolo flying the robotic arm and actually flying the spaceman on, in the spacesuit around to the different work sites to go ahead and get the work done. And so it's a big, big team effort to get that done. We also do a lot of uh, outreach. Well, uh, part of our, the activity that we do there is talking to school kids like you. Uh, we had the opportunity to talk to school all over the world, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, in uh, Japan, in the United States. And it's always interesting, all the questions that we get and uh, the way that things are framed. And it's fun to be able to show you guys, you know, what it's like to be up there. Um, with, guess what? Go yeah, we, we, we had the opportunity of being up there in Halloween and we decided, I decided, I finally want to be a real a spider man so uh, uh, we brought up some costumes and we played around uh, a little bit i was able to actually fly in space uh, grabbing as spider man it was interesting and my kids picked out my costume so i was the minion and so that was okay because i was the commander of the space station i got to be the minion 
Um, but guess what? Life goes on. You're, sh you're still human. You're still up there. And for me, I had a birthday while I was up there, and Paolo and Sergei helped uh, celebrate that birthday. We don't get to have actual flames outside of the experiments, so my little hat had the candles up there made out of cloth. Um, we uh, got to be able to put on our, our space Hawaiian shirts and have Aloha Fridays. And we had ground control join in the fun and kind of you know join us on the mission and, and wear their Hawaiian shirts on Friday as well. Um, we were surfing in space, right? Yes, we, we were, were surfing. Trying. We were showing off. And then, you know, at a certain point, it was a, a moment where I kind of complained with the managers that we don't get to do pizza in space. And sure enough, this, they send us a few things so we could actually make pizza and that was the first time that we actually end up doing it I thought eh, you know nothing can compare to a really good Italian pizza uh, but actually in space even though with all the the little problems that we have you know you can really not cook pizza uh, we were able to have our own special pizza you did uh, pepperoni right I did the meat lovers on the far right side it's covered completely in pepperoni <laughs> and the pepperonis all stick to it because of the surface tension of the sauce that surface the surface tension of that holds it onto the the pizza dough I did an anchovy and olives and, uh, and then I had to share it uh, with one of my colleagues so I took a pair of scissors and and carried it away and of course it's really incredible because everything floats away and it's nice when your pizza is floating away come back here <laughs> And, and we called those the flying saucers of the edible kind. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after 139 days, it was time to come home. Time for us to leave. We had trained up the crew who had joined us for Expedition 53. And we were going to leave in Expedition 54. Another three crew members were going to go ahead and uh, come on up. And so after 2,224 orbits of the Earth, or 58,835,000 miles, uh, it was time for us to, uh, us to go ahead and come on home. And uh, we ended up coming back, landing uh, in 15, minus 15 degree weather in Kazakhstan, when it had been 115 degrees on the positive side when we launched. And we were really happy to be home December 14th last year, got to join our families for Christmas. That looks like an incredible trip. Thank you so much for sharing. Are you ready to take another, a couple more questions? Absolutely. Why don't you start? Was being a Marine helpful to becoming an astronaut? Being a Marine was certainly very helpful for becoming an astronaut. Uh, I was fortunate to get a Marine Corps scholarship to go to college, and then I was able to become a, a Marine Corps pilot. And the things that I learned about teamwork, depending on your, your crewmate next door and, and working as hard as you can to make sure you didn't let them down while you're accomplishing the mission. Plus the things that I was able to learn in the Marine Corps uh, along the way with training as far as being a pilot, uh, training to be able to do the mission with the airplane that I was assigned uh, to fly. Uh, and then certainly it was, it was exciting for me to be able to represent the Marine Corps in space and be able to share great pictures of uh, Marine Corps flags floating all over the earth because that's what Marines do. They serve other people just like astronauts serve humankind and we're all working together to further the, the human exploration of space. Paolo, you were also in the military too. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how that helped you? Uh, yes, in my previous life, I like to call it before I, I became an engineer, uh, I was in the Army. Um, uh, I ended up working for the Special Forces that uh, required me to really push myself in every single direction. Uh, it really taught me, as Randy said, that uh, with the, the right equipment, uh, the right education, you need to study and know what's going on. Uh, with the right training and above all with the right team, you can really go where it's, you think it's impossible to go. Let me ask you a question. What was one of the coolest science experiments you did while you were in space? Oh, I did personally, I mean as a crew we did 300 plus experiments, personally actually touched uh, 60. I would have difficulties in saying which one was the coolest one because you know, a lot of the experiments that we were doing, I was, we were showed before a picture of this, a Z-Bot. It's a fluid experiment that has to do with fluids and, and uh, heat and how things change. It's, it's an incredible experiment. But I have difficulties in understanding it. You know, I'm there touching buttons. Uh, I think that's a cool experiment. Um, the, one, uh, we, we, the one that we could touch when, when we saw the lettuce grow, for example, when we tasted it, that was also very nice. We had uh, uh, many that had to do with measuring our body, you know, taking bloods, and we had some uh, uh, animals on board that we, we, we had to take care of. It was, all of them were really interesting. I, I would have really hard time to, to mention one. Every day you have fun in an in, in incredible number of different fields. What about you? 
The, uh, you know, heard Paolo mention the animals we had. So we had an experiment of, of mice from Japan. And half the mice, we let stay in zero gravity. So they floated around the whole time that they were up there for a month. The other ones, we actually put in little habitats and we spun them in a little centrifuge so they could feel Earth's gravity. So the only time they had zero gravity was just for a few minutes coming up. And then uh, the majority of the month they had 1G. And so the whole time they were up there, we were taking samples and observing them. And it was funny for me to see a mouse up there in zero gravity. All of a sudden they, you know, lost their reaching out trying to get a hold of something. And it made me think, I wonder if that's what I looked like when I first got to zero gravity as well for the first time. But with those mice, they will send them back to Earth and be able to study how their bodies and bones had changed for zero gravity versus gravity. And that helps us understand our own bodies and how our bones and everything change. And that will help us give us countermeasures for when we go to Mars and other places way beyond that where we don't have gravity, how we can make sure our human bodies stay in the best shape they can. Well, Paolo and Randy ran a lot of experiments while they were on the International Space Station, but before they launched, Comrade was very nice to work with us to develop some lessons that you can run in your classroom. Let's check out ISS Science. Hello, astronaut Randy Bresnik. I'm here to talk to you about puffy head bird legs, because that's what happens to us when we get to orbit. All the fluid that's in our body can now go wherever it needs to, and at the same pressure. Because right now, I've got all this water in my legs that's keeping it so I have enough water in my head so I don't pass out. Well, it turns out that when you get to space, that extra gallon and a half of water that's there to counteract gravity floats up and makes your head really, really puffy, really uncomfortable. So if you kind of like hung upside down for about a half an hour here in gravity, that would be about how your head feels. And so until you get past the you know, day, day and a half mark up in space where you can urinate out that extra gallon and a half, it's pretty, you know, pretty stuffy and puffy head. All right, now over to Marty and Beth to learn more. Thanks, comrade. Let's talk a little bit about puffy head bird legs. I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is astronaut Glovey McGloverson. As you can see, he's filled with fluid, and that fluid right now is down here in his feet. If you've ever stood on your feet for a long time, you'll notice it'll swell up. That's because the fluid is making its way down to your feet. Now let's see what happens when we flip him upside down. All of that fluid rushes down to his head and, and you know, leaves the foot region. And, you know, if you were doing that, it would feel like you kind of had a stuffy head. Now this happens to astronauts when they go into space. This fluid is not pulled down by gravity, so it sort of floats around. It gets up into your head and you get a puffy head and little bird legs. If you want to try this in your classroom, head over to our website and check out the lesson plan. Um, tell me about what you took up into space. Well, I also had the help of my children to pick this one out. And they found this and said, Papa, Papa, take this in space. This is really fun. So have any of you ever touched one of these? All right, so this is the one that actually you'll, you'll see in the video that actually flew in space. And what I think is really cool about this is it's a great demonstration of Newton's laws using something that you are all familiar with. Was it a lot of fun to play with in space? It was, and you know what? If you hadn't seen me touch it and I just let go of it, it would still be floating up there spinning because there's nothing to slow it around. <laughs> awesome. Well, are you guys ready to take some questions? Absolutely. All right, let's go to an audience question first. Hi, my name is Leslie. What fun things do astronauts do on the space station? What fun things do you guys do? Oh, we can do a lot of fun things. Uh, uh, we just, uh, I mean, one of the nicest things to do is actually go and look at the Earth. Uh, just, just put your nose on, the, on this cupola. We have a huge window. You can actually look at the Earth. And you just see the planet passing by, and it's passing at like four miles per second. If you're there for an hour, you actually, an hour and a half, you actually see the whole Earth passing under you. Five continents, seasons, uh, you know, day, night, everything like this. But then, uh, you know, we can play it around uh, with Randy with, you know, the, 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 the spinner, the fidget. Uh, we were doing a lot of things. We actually did one STEM demonstration that you can go find online where we had a bungee cord stretched across the module. Yes. And you pulled it back, and so we had a line to know that we were pulling back for the same amount of force. And we shot things of different mass or different size or different weight uh, if they were back on Earth. But we started off with a little uh, thing of chapstick. Instead of go, and you saw how fast it zipped off. And we tried something a little bigger, a little model of the Orion spacecraft. And it shot off a little, little uh, slower. Then we took a big, huge trash bag, 
pulled it back with the same amount of force, you know, force equals mass times acceleration, and we let it go, and you saw it just float off really, really slow. And so being able to show you guys, you know, like, like Marty said, physics in action in zero gravity, that was one of the fun things we got to do. And by the way, we did not only these things, we were playing with food, by the way. Yes, can you imagine yes. what you can do with food floating around all the place and station? That's what we did. Nice. All right, we've got an online question next. All right, we're going to take an online question next. From an, astro from an astronaut wannabe, what is expected from an applicant to be considered? All right, right now, for government astronauts, just about any uh, country you, you're looking at applying to, um, you've got to be able to have a basic uh, education, and most companies require a bachelor's degree in some of the, the uh, science, uh, math, engineering, or, or, or hard sciences types of uh, fields, because that's kind of the, the basis for the work that we're doing. But there's certainly many people that have advanced degrees in those fields, um, as well as you know, graduate work. And the biggest thing is once you get an education in whatever field it is, becoming excellent in that field is the key. If you look at any of the astronaut biogra uh, biographies of anybody that's ever you know, been in uh, space from any country, they're all pretty similar. You see that someone has really worked hard to get their education, but then gone on to be really good at their field. And they also have a wide variety of interests. It isn't just that they are one dimensional. You know, people that are, you know, concert pianists that have been an engineer. People, you know, got one, one gentleman who, you know, played professional soccer to put himself through medical school to be a doctor who became an astronaut. And then you've got, you know, guys like Paolo who started out, you know, in the Italian Army and now, you know, is a, a engineer for ESA and has now flown in space 300 times and, you know, is the number two person most experienced. 300 days. 300, over 300, 300 days in space. <laughs> so, wide variety and being excellent at what you do. Um, are definitely the path to be, uh, becoming an astronaut. I would say astronaut. that you really need to speak English, by the way, minimum, it, which is obvious for you guys, but not so much for, for us uh, foreigners. So uh, that's, uh, that's a requirement too. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much. We're just about out of time. We want to remind everybody watching to tune in next week as we look at observatories and how we know what's out there. Did you know you do not need the Hubble Space Telescope to view distant galaxies? You can see them from right here on Earth using a pair of binoculars. Is it safe to look at the sun? Can you and your friends find a black hole? How do we see the oldest things in the universe? If you want to know how we know what's out there, be sure to check out STEM in 30. Well, while Comrade was in space, we actually had an opportunity to talk to him, and he had a little surprise for us. If you check out the video, you'll see that we were uh, a little excited about this. Took one of our bookmarks into space. That was absolutely incredible. Comrade, thank you for doing that for us. Yeah, we really, uh, we were very, very excited. And it's oh. back! <laughs> back from space with 58 million miles on it. There's your bookmark. Wow! <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, of course, we want to thank both of our guests, Paolo and Randy, for coming out today, and Providence Middle School. Yep, and we want to thank uh, Boeing for sponsoring the show. Thanks, Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Ooh.